Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll talk to you more about that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention in, in the in the in the background for this committee report today, uh, there were a set of recommendations, many of which have been mentioned already, that were laid out by the California Housing Partnership Corporation, and many of you have mentioned a number of them, including Senator Bell's bill, which I, for the life of me, still don't understand why it was vetoed. Um, there's another bill that was vetoed. That's AB 1229 that has to do with um, allowing cities to pass inclusionary housing requirements. And I, I actually looked it up, and I, I found this. Be, yeah. So here's the, the governor's veto message, and I just would love everyone's thoughts on this. Um, he writes, as mayor of Oakland, uh, I saw how difficult it can be to attract development to low- and middle-income communities. Requiring developers to include below-market units in their projects can exacerbate these challenges, even while not meaningfully, meaningfully increasing the amount of affordable housing in a given community. I love your thoughts. You're all experts on this issue. Um, this has been kind of the interesting uh, critique of inclusionary housing. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. So, you know, I think inclusionary zoning, is, there's not a one-size-fits-all of what an inclusionary zoning ordinance looks like for an individual community. And I think that is where you get into a lot of challenges. So I think uh, the governor, former mayor of Oakland, uh, is correct in some regards, depending on how you craft that inclusionary ordinance for Oakland uh, in a way that doesn't... Um, add so much cost to the private development that is marginally, perhaps, in Oakland at that time when he was speaking, might have been marginally able to happen on an economic basis, right? So uh, it's, it's how you craft an inclusionary ordinance that doesn't uh, lay so, many, so much costs on it that it kills the goose that lays the golden egg. And I think many communities have found that right balance between incentives of density bonuses and other kinds of incentives for the developers um, so that at the same time you are you know, getting the uh, in inclusionary uh, units. I, to your transit corridor question as an example, um, I think it's really important that um, when you're having new population growth and you're having new development in certain areas that are under a lot of pressure, um, that at the same time you are thinking about both preserving the existing affordability, affordable housing in the area uh, and, and stabilizing those uh, neighborhoods with additional affordable units. But it's got to be done in a way that doesn't kill the new, um, uh, the economics of, of new uh, housing. I just comment on that because I think it, I agree with Carol, and I think the, the the places where it works most effectively are places where there's a lot of very high values. So in places like Fremont, uh, other jurisdictions, um, we've done a, a lot of work uh, with those cities on ordinances that allow for a lot of flexibility in how you meet the ordinance. So, for example, a developer could dedicate a piece of land to a nonprofit like Eden, and that helps them meet their requirement without having to write a big check on a per unit basis or without having to sell three houses to some, some three families that win a lottery and essentially give three families a million dollar subsidy each in some cases. And so I think where the best ordinances work, they allow for flexibility, they recognize that there's some some room there to negotiate. And what 1229 did is it didn't say that every city sh should have an ordinance. It basically said that if you have an ordinance, you can, if you want to, have it apply to rental housing. And so uh, it was very distressing to have that not get approved because there was, in a lot of the high cost areas, there are now projects being developed that are 100% market rate rental that could have done some amount of affordable housing and we just lost that opportunity. I'll point out inclusionary housing works best where it's needed the most and vice versa. The market will tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah. And in San Diego, we do have inclusionary, zone, uh, inclusionary housing. We have had every step of the way. And the way we crafted it is not unconstitutional or illegal. It's simply a, an impact fee based on development. And the um, um, developer will pay the fee or in lieu thereof, if he or she decides otherwise, can put it on site. So it's the reverse of what was declared unconstitutional. It's not um, rent control, it's an impact fee. And if the degree of, of the lack of affordability is significant enough to cause the need for the impact fee, then the property will be able to carry the cost. Mm. If it's not, it won't. And the market dynamics will let you know. Okay, Bob. 
Yeah. I'd like to get back to uh, the status quo because I mean, Jerry Brown in the redevelopment built a lot of uh, uh, housing like an MLK and Telegraph on 19th, 20th, 21st, which was just coincidentally close to the Bard, but in a real beat up part of the town, right? I mean, nobody would refute that. I mean, the A's were gonna go there. And it, likewise in San Jose, and I don't know how it is in San Diego, we're getting housing that's been built in the inner core where it was just ugly. I mean, it was just ugly next to the railroad tracks and we're putting up these the, these projects, and or we did, and again, we forget that you needed a blighted area in redevelopment. What I see, I see now, um, and congratulations for the Berkeley City Council for finally approving a project, because there's a big line of projects that they said no to before they before they before got they to the CEQA yeah. challenge. They they had they they know how to say no on their own. Um, I, I see that there's a f there you know what the status quo in the local areas is is, is you intimated, uh, Mr. Gentry is is that people don't want any change. They got no. their house and no. they don't want anything built. Uh, and you know unless it's a blighted area or it's right downtown, you know they'll they'll go with that. And you people, you people, you know the <laughs> housing advocates have to try to like squirrels try to find that that one plot of land that's not offensive to this to the, the neighbors because as soon as you get uh, a project that may be on the transit corridor go through the bay area on the, on the bar you go to south hayward and or downtown hayward and they reject these projects that are good projects because <coughs> the neighbors come out and say they don't like it and i represent these people um so that's a local control problem I mean, I, a reality, a reality. Um, so I don't know what we can do because we, we have these unfunded mandates that we set up and I would love to start doing some of those and making the cities uh, um, perform. And I had my little rant about the second units, but, but that's the, I can identify it that I think it's wrong, but I think that the city councils, the people that get elected, the people who get involved in local areas in these things really, I mean, they'll talk out one side of their mouth and say, yeah, you affordable housing people, we love it. But then when it comes down to voting on these things, they just want to maintain the status quo. Um, so that's, that's, that's if you can re respond to that. And then in full disclosure, I'm the chairman of environmental quality, which has the CEQA responsibility. So um, in, uh, listening to what you're saying, I have a question after I get your response. So just a, a quick quick response on uh, what can you do about, you know, the local governments not approving housing. I think it goes back, both Linda and I mentioned it. Uh, you know, you can put stronger teeth uh, into housing element law. I'm, I'm actually uh, working on a paper, so this may not be for the, this legislative session, but uh, on the benefits of a law in Massachusetts that essentially says, if you're not meeting as a local, Entity, if you're not meeting your affordability requirements uh, in your jurisdiction, and a proposal comes forth that you know has a certain percentage affordable uh, affordable housing as a component of it, um, if you don't approve it through an expedited uh, process, then it goes to a state appeals board uh, that you know can approve it. Now, I get that no, no local government um, you know wants to have their and, and you, you all have been local officials, want to have their local authority taken away. Uh, but at some point, again, we have to change the rules if we're going to change the outcomes. Yeah, I just want to add to that because I think if you looked at CEQA law in its current form, the, it has an exemption for infill housing and an exemption for affordable housing. And very few jurisdictions actually use those exemptions because they're afraid they're going to get sued. So I, I think you, if you narrowly looked at CEQA and those two exemptions and came up with some very specific cases where that exemption was a little more ironclad, it would probably help those of us trying to use those. And, you know, in fairness to a lot of the cities, the staff really wants to get stuff done. And a lot of times the councils want to vote yes. In Palo Alto, the council did vote yes, and the citizens took them to the ballot to undo a, an affordable housing project. And so, I mean, that's the other place. I mean, Berkeley actually is famous for that as well, is, you know, if somebody gets an affordable housing project approved at the council level, being able to sue to stop it seems uh, you know, inconsistent with the goals of the state and that somehow you should close that loophole. And some would argue that nothing on earth touched by a human being is without some environmental damage. 
So therefore, how do you define the scope and the extent and, and the re remediation? And part of it is defining the scope. And if as you're looking at one particular uh, project in and of itself with multiple stopping points, that's one issue. But the other is in a broader ramification. If you stop that project because of issues there, but you cause development to occur going further out, so that's a greater overall environmental damage done just through greater automobile traffic that's occurring. Um, that to me would obviate what CEQA was designed to be in the first place. I mean, I know I know you are familiar with this, that it's usually, you know, the CEQA is the process that one has to go through. It's the other laws that people pick and uh, hide under. I guess my question is, is that do you think that we can tailor uh, um, language that is specific under the, the umbrella of SB 375 that can um, allow, I guess by right, the construction of this the housing and that that uh, you can go, I mean, I think you were suggested that it, uh, Ms. P Professor Galante, um, <laughs> that, uh, that we would, it would be the measurement of mitigation, that you don't stop the project, you keep the, whether it's a, it's a lawsuit or it's a uh, appeal to some newly discovered uh, or newly created, but that the, the right to build continues if it meets X, Y, and Z, or whatever the criteria is, so that it's a different, it's a measurement of what your mitigation is going to be versus stop the project. I can't believe I said that publicly, but that's my question. My question. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think you've I think you've got it. I mean, uh, this whole issue of you know, Seek was looking at an individual project in its individual site, and you're looking at the impact of the cars from that project on the streets around it. You're not looking at you know the alternative of. Uh, if that project doesn't get built there, it's going to get built way out Further there, out. and that's going to cause worse environmental damage. So if you if you came up with language, or you know we help someone come up with language that basically says you know if you're within a certain uh, area that is the place where the state wants to drive new residential development, uh, and maybe not just residential development, but if this is where you uh, want to drive growth and you meet certain criteria, you, you know, you, you know, like CEQA doesn't apply. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. We'll uh, appreciate that. And we'll, uh, we'll go on our final panel and then take public comment. So uh, appreciate thank all you of you coming. Um, next one is uh, financing solutions, innovative land use. Uh, we'd like to have our next panelist, Matt Reagan, Kevin Zwick, Marianne Gallego, Nick Kavalanit, Kav Kalavita, Kalavita, from San Diego. Okay, why don't you? Uh, I think we got. Uh, do we have enough chairs? Yeah, we do. We're okay. So welcome. Good to see you. Okay, Matt. Need a here. Matt Reagan is first from the Bay Area Council. Um, um, welcome. And 